Hey, good morning, fam. It is so good to be with you once more. And just like our lead team said, you know, happy Father's Day. I want to personally wish you, uh, along with my family, um, to all the men that are present at our broadcast campus, those online uh, from our family, uh, to you, uh, happy Father's Day. We really do appreciate the men here at Hope City. And it's so great to know that so many of you guys showed up and are there right now. And so, Without further ado, you know, I love to always introduce myself. Uh, for those who are visiting, and I know like a day like today, uh, we, we probably do have some um, people who are guests visiting with us, maybe even jumping online, uh, checking us out. Uh, so my name is John Paul, and together with my lovely wife, Sarah, our family, uh, we actually have the privilege of serving and leading here at Hope City uh, for this season and man we do count it our privilege and our honor and i'm so grateful that um you would allow us to walk with you on your spiritual journey and if you're visiting with us we pray that hope city feels like home and we will get to connect soon all right so i'm uh, grateful for all of you those who call hope city of your home uh grateful for you guys as always as well and that's why i love to make mention of our amazing dream team uh, come on, put, put your hands together, make some noise, come on, show them some love. Uh, if you're visiting with us, our dream team are the men and the women and the kids even who uh, serve here at Hope City. They give up their treasure, their time, their talent. And so, man, uh, for everyone who serves uh, this church, thank you so much. Uh, you know, we always love to remind people that uh, who you see on the stage uh, is usually and uh, most times not even a fraction of the people that it takes uh, to build this church. And so we're always grateful for those that you may not always see, uh, but they definitely do their part. All right. So one of the things that uh, we like to remind you around here, uh, you guys know what it is. If you've been with us, if you're visiting with us, we got one house rule and I've got to let you know, uh, especially for you men, especially for you men. Uh, here at Hope City, we say no perfect people allowed um and that's just our reminder uh, wherever you are in your walk with god you may be far from him right now uh, that you don't need to get it perfect you don't need to get it all together before you come to him and even for us who've been serving god for any length of time it is our reminder of where we've come from that we are all sinners saved by god's grace and so we don't ever want to be the church that becomes too proud that becomes too uh far off that we look down at people when they come in with their uh, brokenness or their stories or, or their baggage, however you want to tell me. And that's why we are a church, no perfect people allowed, all right? So I uh, hope that helps you to feel a little bit at ease that you're around people just like you, all right? <laughs> well, I hope you do understand that. Uh, one thing that we ask of you, and especially on service like today where Man, I, I want to speak to the men so much. And we ask you, hey, share that service uh, on your socials. Share it uh, online at Hope City TT. Um, it's easy to find across Facebook, YouTube. And just um, share it. We, we, we have two things that we try to do here really well as a church. And that is to preach the gospel of Christ and disciple those who God has called us to. Yeah, so if you believe in our mission, all right, you can take all your phones now, those at our campus, and you can definitely uh, just share the service right now. We've been in a series uh, that we've called Open War, and um, it is just really to introduce the church, uh, our community, uh, into spiritual warfare. Though many of you guys would have uh, have the background, you you have some experience, some understanding of it. You know, as a community, we wanted to recognize that, listen, this war following after Jesus, it's a war. Uh, and and so every person we're born into this war, and that was week, week one's message, uh, born into war, that, listen, even if you're far from God, maybe you're visiting with us, you know, someone dragged you out because it's Father's Day. All right, man, I know that awkward feeling sometimes, but listen, uh, even if you aren't a follower of Christ, you there is a battle over your life. There is a battle uh, that you wait. And, and some of you, I don't even need to go too deep into that. 
our life could feel like a battle at times. And, and so we, we dived into that, had the battle between God and the forces of darkness over our lives. Uh, week two, we spoke about war and ego. And you all remember what the main line was? It's not about us. It's not about us, even though we are the ones that may suffer, may go through our harm and, you know, really feel the effects of this war, this spiritual warfare. And the truth is, it's really about God's kingdom. And sorry to burst your bubble for some of you, but war and ego. Listen, if we're going to have to fight this, this battle, these battles that we face, whatever the trial is in your life, um, you got to have the right perspective. You got to have the right perspective that listen, this is not about us. Um, because if we make it about us, we'll make the wrong choices, and and eventually we will lose on some of those battles. And this week, in honor of our fathers, um, I want to speak a lot to the men, but it is for all of us. It is war on our vision, I, I, and I, I was a little bit torn between the titles for this. Uh, for this particular message, because uh, I had it for a long time, I actually still have it in my notes, war on our resolve, like the ability to not give up, the ability to keep fighting, uh, despite what you see, despite what is around you. Uh, but the more that I dove into the text and, uh, and the more that God kind of led me in this direction, I decided it's one vision. And here's why. If we don't see the battle the right way or from God's perspective, uh, we definitely not going to stand and fight. We're not going to stay in the fight. We're not going to, or we're going to fight for the wrong things the wrong way. So while the ego was one part of it, I think the way that we see things really matter. But at the end of the day, my challenge to us all, especially men, because uh, men carry a different weight, even though it's not spoken about or recognized much, um, men carry a lot more weight than honestly we're given credit for <laughs> yeah gonna be the unpopular preacher with this but i know, I know with the brothers they, they're gonna they're gonna feel me they're gonna understand especially you fathers um i remember growing up as a pastor's kid um looking at my parents and especially my father as a pastor for many years i've seen the church change and go through transitions and i want to say this man if you uh, if you don't understand uh, the difficulties of leading a church, um, you, you you really don't understand the weight uh, of some of our leaders and what they, they endure week in, week out. And I saw that personally up close with my father. And church life is not easy. Church life is not easy. Uh, and I know you can agree with that. I know some of you, um, you you've shared and expressed some of the uh, difficult experiences you've been through. Uh, by abusive leaders and, and, and all that and, and different things that come with that. And so uh, you know this, right? Church life could be a messy thing. And so for pastors, kid, yeah, I, I saw that mess. I saw that mess, but I saw it from a different perspective as well, uh, where I saw um, so much happening. Uh, but one, one thing that I saw demonstrated as a living example, like from my father, was uh, he, he never gave up. Uh, for those years that I was in that ministry and, and, and grew up in his household, I saw the church go through um, lots of changes, lots of uh, hard seasons. I remember there was a time um, the church was uh, well over probably like 200 people or so. And man, because of betrayal, because of um, jealousy and, and whatnot, I saw the church dwindle. We had like a handful, 10, 15, 20 sometimes. And um, I, I would see seasons like that rebuild and you keep persevering. So, man, I resolved not to give up. I've, I've, I've been blessed to see that in action. I, I don't think um, from a leadership point of view, uh, church life is hard just because maybe someone does you something wrong. No, sometimes it's a lot of, because of our own failure. Uh, early in, um, I mean, hopes you're not that old, right? But in the early moments when we were launching, there were uh, some leadership decisions that I should have made and I delayed to make and warning signs that I ignored that ended up hurting our teams and, and our, our, our ministry. And the truth is, churches suffer even because of our inadequacy as leaders. And so the, the 
resolve to keep going, uh, to learn and grow through those things, through those seasons. It's really important. And in this battle, <laughs> you are already a part of. It's going to take resolve. It's going to take a certain level of determination and intentionality to stay in the fight. But the battle is not just to stay in the fight. The battle is not just to survive. Because some of you are in a battle and whether you want it to run or not, you can't. Um, but the truth is, the battle is to stay obedient to what God wants in this season. And that's my challenge for you, to, to have the resolve, to endure, to do what is right, to do what God has called you to. And especially you men, because I know it's hard. I know we live in a society where uh, it's not honoring to men. Uh, like we, we don't mind men who work themselves um, into like overwork themselves once they provide. Like we don't mind that 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 role. But let men start to step up and lead spiritually to lead their families the way that God has called them to. And then you start to see a little bit of differences, different reactions, and and men shouldn't speak into this topic or that topic. No, uh, there, there's lots of things that I know works against us but your resolve has to be to be obedient to god and not to man not to men's opinion not to culture's opinion not to uh, what people think about you but who god has called you to be and so it's a resolve with obedience and many of us will find ourselves not just with the temptation to run away from battles or or to run away from where god has us in these moments uh, but it is to stay and fight the way that God wants us to. And so we've been in a, a story of um, Queen Esther. Uh, it's a book in the Bible, Esther, and a historical account of uh, this young Jewish woman who was an orphan, raised by a guardian by the name of Mordecai, and because she didn't have her parents. She lost her parents there in a, a captivity. The Jewish people are captive under a foreign king, and the story just goes, and I, I can't go through every aspect of it, so you can look online at our social and, and find the messages before, but read the book of Esther. That's what I've challenged our community uh, to do through this season. Um, and so Esther and Mordecai, Esther becomes queen because the king gets rid of his old queen because she disrespects him. Um, she goes through the process. Mordecai is uh, mentoring her, guiding her. We see that through uh, this account of uh, these individuals, and Esther is finally queen. And so it, it, the story could have ended there. You know, we, we would love it to end there, you know, as, as Christians. You know, oh, God's favor from an orphan to the queen uh, over the land. It hey, sounds like, yeah, sounds like a nice message I would preach. But the truth is, uh, her role as queen would serve in a greater way for the salvation of God's people. And the reason that there was a threat to God's people was uh, there, the king had a, a guy that he promoted called Haman, and he made him like second in command. He made him over all the other leaders, over all the other princes. He had rulership uh, only second to the king himself. And so Haman was a very powerful man, and Haman ended up having a little altercation with Mordecai, uh, a continuous altercation, actually. Uh, you see, because of his position and his power, uh, he expected and he desired that every time he came around, people would bow. And what got him obsessed was the fact that Mordecai would not. Mordecai would not bow or show reverence to him in that way. And that became his sort of obsession. And so Haman, full of his power and his pride and all these things, he decides, you know what, it's not good enough just to kill Mordecai he finds out that Mordecai is a Jew, and so he gets the king to sign and make a decree that all Jews will be killed. You'll get this, like, that's the kind of battles that we face. Like, you may not even be responsible for the altercation. You may not be responsible for the situation, but you find yourself in a battle that you aren't supposed to be fighting. And that's the nature of warfare. That's the nature of spiritual warfare, especially. And so that conflict turns into a great danger for God's people. And so last week we left off where I was trying to show you the dialogue between Esther and Mordecai because Esther is in the palace, Mordecai is still in the city. And Esther hears that Mordecai is mourning 
And so conversation between Esther, Servants, and Mordecai as they transfer the messages back and forth. And, and last week, if you missed our message, I do encourage you to go back and look at it. Uh, Mordecai basically rebukes Esther and tells her, listen, uh, don't think because you're queen that you'll be spared, that you would, you would not perish with us. And he tells us straight some really hard truths, but much needed truth. And, and, and the fact was, her position, her, her favor to be in the position of queen was probably for this set time that, that, that the people of God would have a voice to the king. Because many times it looks like the enemy has all the favor, has all the connections, has everything. But God, he places his people in the right places for the right time. And so Mordecai kind of brings her to that truth. And so we're going to see one of the most profound and clear examples of resolve from the Bible. And it's in Esther. Man, that woman shows uh, some fortitude, something that we got to demonstrate in the times that we live in, uh, something we got to demonstrate in the battles that we face. And so you have Mordecai mourning, Esther is confronted, and now Esther responds this way. Look with me. Our scriptures will be in your worship guide. They will be on the screen as well. Esther chapter 4, verse 15 to 17. So this is Esther responding to Mordecai. Go gather all the Jews who are found in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. And my attendants also will fast in the same way. And then I will go into the king which is not accordance with the law. And this is her resolve. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and did just as Esther had commanded him. I love this tune. I love this, um, this, this dynamics for us to learn from. And uh, not just the fact that she had that resolve to say, listen, because if she went in to see the king and, and the law and the rule was that if you are not summoned, you are put to death unless the king shows favor. And so that's why she says, if I perish, I perish. Uh, because she was determined. She had the resolve to say, listen, this battle is not about me. There's something bigger at stake. And that's a great part. But you know what I love in verse 17? Because if you were here with us last week, you would have heard how Mordecai spoke to her. Verse 17 says, so Mordecai went away and did just as Esther had commanded him. And I love that. The mentor, the guardian, he followed instruction. Why? Because Esther was now in alignment with what God wanted her to do. And she was willing to take the risk, so he was willing to follow her command. Because it was spiritual now, because she was going into prayer and fasting. That's next week's message. I'm not going to spend much time there. But Esther fully understood now. She understood fully at this point that the battle was not about her. And what was required to align to God's purpose. And though it would have potentially cost her her life, she was determined to do what was right in that moment. So let's fast forward in the story just for the sake of time. As she goes into the king's court, he extends his golden scepter, which is a sign of favor to allow her to come. She wasn't going to get killed. And so Esther gets favor with the king to hear the request. And so the request she makes is to have a banquet. She's inviting the king to come and eat with her in a banquet along with Haman, the, the, the one who she knows is the enemy of, of her people and of her life. And so Esther chapter 5, verse 5 to 8, we, we hear the interaction between the king and Esther uh, through this banquet. And so the king said, bring Haman quickly so that we may do as Esther desires. So the king and Haman came to the banquet which Esther had prepared. Verse 6, as they drank their wine at the banquet, the king said to Esther, What is your request? For it shall be granted to you. And what is your wish? Up to half of the kingdom it shall be done. So Esther replied, My request and my wish is, if I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my request and do what I, I wish, may the king and Haman come to the banquet which I will prepare for them, and tomorrow I will do as the king says. And remember what I said, resolve in your time of war to stay ob 
expedient. Esther goes on a mission to save her people, but she's offered great favor for personal gain. And, and if you want to look at it in our modern terms, like advancement. Um, the, the, l- let me just be very clear. When the king says, up to half of the kingdom and it shall be done, it's not that he's literally uh, offering her half the kingdom. It's, a, it's the way that they would speak. Kings would speak when you've obtained favor with them. It's like, it's an absurd amount to give away half of your kingdom. Yeah, but it is the measure to show, to convey the idea that, listen, whatever you ask of me, I'll do for you. And so she's gotten the favor. Now, one of the things that I want us to understand in this spiritual warfare, number one, if you're taking notes, we need clear vision. We need clear vision. And a lot is said in our modern day, even within the churches, I think incorrectly sometimes, but uh, vision is a big part of what you hear a lot about. So you in this business world, you got to have a clear vision and, and, and to build and success and all this. But that's not what I'm, I'm targeting today. You see, last week we spoke a lot about pride and ego. And those things block and skew and honestly contaminate our vision. And here's why I'm saying this, based on this interaction with Esther and the king. She goes in there. So her first bit of favor is that she wasn't killed, right? Because she made the request. The king followed through. The king so enjoying the banquet and the fact that he, he probably is lo- he, he loves his queen or wants to please her or wants to uh, make her happy, he offers her great favor. Listen, anything you ask. Now, theologians debate why Esther didn't ask at that point. Maybe she was still scared. Maybe she wasn't confident yet that the king would grant her request because Haman is a very powerful man in the kingdom as well, and he's there. But she wanted him there because he's the issue. So we don't know why she thinks. We don't know if it's strategic. We don't know if it was out of fear. But here's what we do know. She didn't take the bait or she didn't fall into a temptation to simply save herself. And hear me with this. If we are making the war and making the battles that we face in our life about us and our own suffering, our own gain, especially, when we face the tough choices, I promise you the enemy will give you an easy way out. If our vision and and the way we see what this battle is about is only on ourselves, then we will probably make the wrong choices. Esther is offered massive favor before the king. That yes, she could turn around the feet for herself or whatever. And, and, and let's be honest, asking for her own salvation or asking for um, to be spared from the, the decree of the king and maybe even asking for she and Mordecai is probably much, a much easier ask than asking the king to go back on his entire word to kill all the Jews. Please understand. So she's given favor, but she doesn't give in to it. And, and here's something that I want to bring to the church's attention today. Jeremiah 23, 16 says, This is what the Lord of armies says. Do not listen to the words of the prophets who are prophesying to you. They are leading you into futility. They tell a vision of their own imagination, not from the mouth of the Lord. Let me be very direct in this one. So what does that have to do with vision? Well, when we don't have clear vision, we don't just only look to seek our own interests, but we, we surround ourselves. And in the church, this is what it looks like. We gravitate to people who speak uh, spiritual things, quote unquote, uh, prophesy or give you words that it's all about self, that you love. That's why you all know I'm going to hit you over this. And for my team, you all need to really pay attention. Stop posting preachers that speak more, that say nice words, uh, but don't align with the scripture. Stop supporting, stop endorsing, stop aligning yourself with people. With I'm talking to the church now, to pastors who preach their own agenda. Having a clear vision that's about God. L- let me say this way. John Stott says, nothing is more important for a mature Christian discipleship than a fresh, 
clear and true vision of the authentic Jesus. You see, the way that we see Jesus determines how we live our lives today. Many of us are following people who advise us or give great messages about a Jesus that is not actually accurate with Scripture. Some of us are following our own Jesus. We, we give our lives to Jesus because we want an easier life. We want more material things. We want blessings in this world. And I'm not saying that God does have things like that for you. I believe he's a good, good father. Right? That's the, you know, that's the, today is the day where that song, you know, probably ringing out through many churches, right? Good, good father. <laughs> but the truth is, he is a good father. He's a perfect father. And, it, and in his word, he says, listen, if you as evil men know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does your heavenly father uh, entreat with you? And so there's no doubt that God wants to take care of us as his children. And we have the perfect example. And, and for some of you who don't have that uh, living example of a father, yeah, God is your father. He is your heavenly father. That's, that, that's one of his greatest and most consistent uh, attributes, or not attributes, but his identification to us. And we are sons and daughters in the kingdom of God. And, you know, for many of us, we don't even have the clear vision of that. But I'm saying to you that if you follow after a God who you think is just about your well-being and your happiness here on the earth, you will make the wrong choices. You will make the wrong choices, especially when things become difficult. Let me say it this way, call over carnality. When you are facing your spiritual battles and your choices in your life, seek to honor the call that God has on your life. A lot of times, you know, uh, being the lead pastor here, I've been pastoring for more than 10 years now. Uh, but for Hope City, even in a short time, but it's been true actually all through my time, in this field, I hear a lot of people talk and their plans and their pursuit and their vision is mainly about stuff in this world. Rarely do you hear people consider, and, and I don't even interrupt this anymore. I listen, to, I listen to people and they talk about their plan and what their decisions ha have to be made. And they, they tell you it's either A or B. And those things are based on the finances most time, based on opportunities, based on their own desire for advancement and stuff. And all those things are not inherently wrong. But you know what you do ever hear about in those major decisions? Uh, how does it affect my pursuit with God? How does it affect my relationship with God? Will it affect my family in serving God? And for me, too many of us are being dictated and deceived because we live by our senses and not obedience to God. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18, Paul gives us some insight and some correction with this, the way that we see things. He says, Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer person is decaying, yet our inner person is being renewed day by day. Listen to what he says, verse 17, For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. If you do not have the right vision of what God wants for you in this season, you will respond to the battle for your personal gain or to avoid suffering. That's our default in the flesh, in the natural, for what is seen. We deal with the senses more than we deal with obedience to God sometimes. Having the right vision helps you to make the right choices. But you know what I found with most lukewarm Christians? Whether it's in a battle or not, when you have to make decisions or pursuit most times are after comfort and convenience. And my question to you, if you are to have results in this battle, and you men, especially, men especially, in this culture that we live in, if you see yourself as a, in the role just to provide and to be successful in this world, 
and you don't recognize that the decisions that you are making are taking you away from the presence of God, then ultimately, we as men, we will lose the battles for our families, for the gospel in this generation. It's not just about how it affects our lives. Do you think that your spiritual walk is something that you're trying to manage and, and try to fight with and, you know, I, I'll be in church more, I'll try, I'll try to do this, I'll try to do that, I'll try to spend time with God daily and so. And every decision we make takes us away from that. So we get up earlier to go to the jobs, to grind harder. Um, and we, we utilize our Sundays because we work so hard, you know, Sundays are the day that we need to relax. We can't, we can't give back to God this way. And the truth is, it doesn't just affect you. There is legacy being lost. Because the real legacy you need to leave is not the house, not the land, not the beautiful education or anything like that. The real legacy that you are called to leave is one that they know who your God is. And for me, you know, I want to be like Joshua in this. We love this saying, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Um, that's nice and cute to say, but if you don't have a clear vision of who God is in your life, who Christ is to you, because he's not just the one who saves you, he's not just um, the one who loves you and is in difficult times. No, he's our, he's our king. So for everyone now, not just the men, the clear vision of who God is is probably where we need to start as a church. He's not just your friend, he's, not, he's your king, he's Lord. He's God, and He's coming back to rule. He's coming back, uh, not, with, not, not with peace, but to war, to make war on the earth. So don't get it twisted, don't get it mistaken, you know. This battle that you and I are in is not one of pass, you know, being passive in, in our approach to it, but it's truly having clear vision what God wants and the resolve, the intensity to pursue it the way God wants. And that's what I want to want to leave you with. Esther chapter 5 verses 9 to 14. I kind of left this in, in a big chunk. Haman has just come out of the banquet with Esther. And, and, and this is where I want to go with this. He's joyful and pleased of heart. That's what the scripture says. Verse 9. But when, So he's happy because he's just come out of the, the banquet that only the king was invited to by his queen and so he's a privileged man to be there but i mean because he doesn't know the truth right but when haman saw mordecai at the king's gate and he did not stand up or tremble before him haman was filled with anger against mordecai verse 10 haman controlled himself however and went to his house but he sent for his friends and his wife zeresh and then haman told them of the glory of his riches his many sons and every occasion on which the king had honored him and how he had been promoted him above the officials and servants of the king so haman also said even esther the queen let no one except me come with the king to the banquet which she had prepared and tomorrow i am invited by her with the king so understand what's happening here this man is you know, you know, he's a perfect example of what we're not supposed to be, right? Like last week's message, that ego, right? He's making boasts of his children. He's making boasts of his riches. He's making boasts of his power, his influence, his favor. Man, he, he has a lot going for him. Verse 13, though. Yet all of this does not satisfy me. Every time I see Mordecai, the Jew, sitting at the king's gate, then Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends said to him, have a wooden gallows, 50 cubits made high in the morning and ask the king. Basically, they basically instruct him. Build a gallow and let's hang Mordecai. Sin, and, and let me say this to you. Remember what we said last week? Who do you have any trenches? Well, this matters. Who you surround yourself with will either give you a good counsel that will lead you back to God or will lead you further away. There's no in between. Huh? Don't get twisted. But here's what I want you to understand. And I want you to get. We need more resolve than the enemy. I want you to write that down. Because here's why. Here's the enemy of the Jews. This man just 
is recorded as being happy and boastful about all the amazing things he has going for him. He is second in command. He has riches. He has favor. He has everything that most of us pursue in this life. But he is still so angry and upset with Mordecai. One man, one man is putting a shadow over all the amazing things that he just boasted in. The enemy sometimes has more resolve than the church. Because here's a man who has so much going for him, but he has the resolve that, listen, we have to get rid of this man. And his, his company, his circle, is, is fueling that fire. And I, I want you to, I mean, see from last week's message, everything that this man is, is what we can't afford to be in this battle. But his resolve to kill Mordecai, despite all that he has going for him, is something that we need to take note of. And here's why. The enemy probably is pursuing you and probably has some situation in your life that is outlasting the faith that you have, that is outlasting the joy that you have, that is outlasting um, the hope that you have. And I'm challenging you, especially us as fathers and as men today, to have resolve that to do what God has called us to do. And I make no come about this aspect. There's a story in the Bible that shows us how we as men can miss it. It is a story of the uh, prophet Elijah right before he passes away. And he's, he's, he's actually, the Bible actually describes he's, he's sick at this point where uh, the sickness that will claim his life. And he's visited by the king of the time, King Joash. And this king is wicked, and, and, and during that season, they, most of these kings didn't do, um, they didn't do what God wanted. And, and the Bible actually describes them as doing evil in the sight of God. But this king comes to the man of God to seek advice, to seek a word, because he needs victory. The enemies of God's people are, are defeating them, are coming against them. And so we have an interaction where he asks the prophet for help. And the prophet gives him that help. He gives him instruction. So 2 Kings, you can read it, chapter 13. I, I encourage you, go read it. But if we're talking about resolve, I want you to listen and, and look at this with some fresh perspective. 2 Kings chapter 13, verses 18. And Elisha said, take the arrows. And he took them. The king took them, right? He gives them arrows. And he says to the king of Israel, strike the ground. So the king is asking for victory over his enemy and the instruction by the man of God take the arrows strike the ground the king struck the struck it three times and then he stopped then the man of God became angry at him and said you should have struck five or six times then you would have struck Aram until you put an end to him but now you shall strike Aram only three times let me ask the question to all of us, but especially the men. What has God said to us? And we give up every time it becomes difficult. We are like that king with the arrows. And so we, we say, all right, we're going to stay in God's presence a little more. Like some of you, you made that commitment. I'm calling you out today. I know. I know I shouldn't probably do that, but no, I love you enough to say. Some of you made that commitment to be in God's presence. You can't say amen. We all say, ouch, right? For some of you, whether men or not, you made that same commitment. You had the arrow in your hand. You go to church, first weekend, the first Sunday in the month, boom, strike. Second time, strike. Third time, something comes up. Rain hit all year. Yeah, 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 because I know the weather, weather different these days, right? But yet, the weather not stopping us from work, but we, we stop striking the ground. Oh, cool, Jay, what are you telling me? Yeah, 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 I come out for it today. I, I see where, okay, this is war. This is war. We can't play with this, right? But some of us, that's how we look in. We strike the ground once, twice, but we want victory. We want God to come through in our lives. God, help us in with our family. Help us to provide. Help us to do this. I'm talking to the men especially, right? God, help us to do this. But yet we have no resolve to do what we said we were going to do. 
We have no resolve. Listen, the enemy has more resolve and more determination than the Church of Jesus Christ. Ouch. I say that because, yeah, I'm part of that. I am part of that. Forget this church, coming to church, reading scripture, praying for your family. What is it? What is it that God has instructed you that in this battle you're supposed to be fighting? For me, I'll be real transparent with you. In this season that's difficult, I'm supposed to be spending a lot more time in prayer than I have been. And there are days as difficult. Me, taking the arrow, strike once. Start off Monday, hot and sweaty. Praying, believing, asking God. Then something happens, hear a report, hear something develop. Lose or win by Tuesday. It happens, I get it, trust me, I know. The battle's fierce. But we got to do better than this king that's recorded in scripture. We got to have the resolve sometimes of what, like what the enemy pursues us with. Mm. That's a word by itself for some of you. Stop making the excuses. Stop waiting for validation from someone. And I want to speak to the men here for this part because I felt this real strongly. Some of you, when you start to do good, your spouses come and doubt you. And they come and tell you and speak to you in the way that you were in the past. And you're trying your best, you know. I know you're trying your best. But can I say this really humbly and really lovingly but very clearly? Men, get over yourself. Get over yourself. Let me say it this way. Sometimes we are being judged for the way that we have lived and the way that we have been. It's okay if the people around us haven't seen the change yet. Keep doing what God has called you to do. Keep striking the ground. Keep holding on to those arrows and keep hitting it till you get the victory. Till you see your enemies utterly destroyed. Till the opinions of people, because here's what, playing, we got to stop playing this victim mentality that this culture wants to give us. Oh, we depressed, we this way, we that way. Okay, get the help that we need. That's what we got to do. But we got to have the resolve to move forward and to press on into this battle. Some of us, we think it's okay to just remain victims and keep talking about it. Then some of y'all don't need counseling, you know. Y'all need the truth. All right, let me not go there because I know people who like me when I start to talk about those things. People love to, to, to come against me with that one. But men especially... Have that resolve. Don't give up. Get back into this game. Get back into this fight. All of us are going through, but don't back down. Church, Hope City family are talking to our community right now. Stop running from the battle. Stop get giving up and getting out of it. Get up, stand up, and be seen in this battle for this season. Show up. Commit. Well, you're going to let rain stop you. You're going to let Something stop you from doing what God has called you to do. You're going to let the opinion of someone that they, they're talking the truth about you, but it's not who you are anymore. You are new in Christ. You are new creation. The old has passed away, you know. Come on. You either believe the word or you don't. So the fear of man has to come out of us. We've got to have that resolve to do what God has called us. All right. I'm taking too much time. Esther chapter 5, verse 9 to 12. Same scriptures. There's a second part of it that I want you to so read that over. There's something else I want to pull from this. So Haman is boasting, making the boasts about himself and all that, right? He's making the boasts of his riches, um, his position, his influence, all these things. Here's the part of this journey in warfare most of us miss. Haman got angry. It is in verse, verse 9. It says, Haman was filled with anger against Mordecai. But listen to verse 10. Haman controlled himself. Do, and I want you to get this part. Let me give you the note first and let me just teach for a moment. Stop looking at what is happening in the natural. Stop looking at what is happening in the natural. Two things with this. Number one, in the natural, Haman looks like he's untouchable. He has all the power. He has all the connections. He has all the riches. He has all the influence. Right? 
So in the natural, if you look at the enemy that is coming against you, it can look like we, we are defeated. It can look, as a matter of fact, not it can, but in our natural strength, there are some battles that we're facing that we cannot win. Straight out. Let's, let, let's admit that. That's why you can't look at this battle through the natural eyes. For, for Esther and for Mordecai, Haman is not untouchable. He has more favor with the king. He has more authority. He has more power. He had, look at it, he got the king to sign a decree to kill out an entire group of people. But everything, but not just that. This is where a lot of us miss it. Mordecai has another encounter with Haman by the king's gate. Haman becomes very angry, and we know he has a hatred for Mordecai. But listen to what the word says. He controlled it. He controlled it. Too many of us. We have an enemy in our life, in our presence. We have the, the presence of the enemy with us, but we can't see it because the enemy has learned to control what you see and what you think about him. And you don't have discerning eyes because everything you're looking at is in the natural. The decisions you're making right now, all you're talking about is the things of how it benefits in the natural. And we don't have eyes to see in the spirit. But can I say to you, and I, I don't want to spend much time with that, I think you understand that to have that discerning eyes. That's why I said you have to have clear vision. It's a war on vision. It's a war on how you see, see things. Now, you could either see things for yourself, for your own gain, and make the wrong decisions like we spoke about initially, or in this part especially. You can be looking at your enemy and only seeing the natural, and they have things hidden. Deception. That's why we fall prey to the deception and the traps of the enemy, because we only look at the natural. We only look at what we see. Haman had so much anger, but he controlled it this time. Ah, on the outside, you could get discouraged or already depressed even that, that, that the battle you are in in the natural looks unwinnable. But here's my encouragement to you. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will also help you. I will also uphold you with my righteous right and come on, somebody needs to receive that. I am reminding you today that no matter what the battle is, no matter how you've messed up, how you've made a mess of that battle even, that if you would put your eyes on the one that matters, if you would have clear vision of who your God is, and your God says to you today, fear not, I am with you. Do not be afraid. He is your God. He is the one strengthening you. Some of you have lost your resolve because you are seeing only what is in the natural. Listen, hear God's promise. You know what he has done for you before. You're going to see him do it again. You're going to see him be faithful again. You're going to see him overcome again. He's been faithful. He's brought you through the battle. I'm speaking to this community right now under the sound of my voice. Some of you would not have been here if not for God's strength, his power, and his might. So today, today, stand strong, stand firm, fight, fight for your God strengthens you. Exodus chapter 14, this is my verse for this season, verses 13 to 14. But Moses said to the people, do not fear, stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will perform for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again ever. Verse 14, hold on to this. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. No more complaining. Come on, no more complaining. No more talking about what the enemy has or what the enemy is doing. Your God, my God, stands with us. He fights the battles for us. That is your strength that you can stand in. That's the resolve you can do what God has called you to do because you are not alone, because he is with you. And not just that, he's the one strengthening you. He's the one sustaining you. Don't give up in this fight. A.W. Tozer says, when I understand that everything happening to me 
is to make me more Christ-like. It resolves a great deal of anxiety. I think I gave you that one already, but I love it so much. In this battle, whatever you're going through, whatever you've lost, whatever is happening, whatever is difficult, if you can have the right vision, the right perspective, to see that all this is working to make you and me to look more like Christ, our Savior and our King, then you can remove the anxiety and the fear of whatever is against you in this season. I don't care what they say, what they do. I don't care who, listen, stop waiting for permission. Men, stop waiting for validation from the people around you. You already are validated by the King of all kings, that he is with you and he's fighting your battles. So for the men especially, I want you to stand up and fight in this season. Let yourself be counted. What has distracted you from what God is saying? Take your eyes off of what you are seeing in the natural and put it back on to what God is doing, what he's saying, and honestly, clear, renewed vision of who God is in the midst of your battles. So your application and your takeaway, very simple. Don't give up. Get up and stand. Let me just pray for you quickly before our team comes. I'm going to pray for our men. But I'm going to pray for all of us to have that resolve, that warm vision to see clearly. But you're going to see clearly so you can make a stand to do what God has called you to do in this season. All right. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Heavenly Father, I just thank you today, O oh God, for your word as always, God, your presence, Lord, but your reminder of who you are, oh God. You are our king, you are our God, and you are the one that fights the battles for us. And so, God, today, O oh God, we commit our lives into your hands. Uh, we ask you, O oh God, to forgive us where we've um, lost faith or where we've been disobedient, O oh God, in what you call us to do, Father, for the decisions that we've made, the commitments we made to you, and we've gone back on it. Forgive us, God, but help us to fulfill it. Help us to stand and, and to be strong in these moments, to be strong for our families and for uh, those around us. Not just the men, oh God, but every one of us, Lord. Uh, but in a special way, oh God, I ask that you would bless the fathers in this house, oh God, and those joining us online. I pray you bless my even my own father right now, oh God, that you would strengthen him and you would strengthen all the fathers, oh God, today, oh God. Uh, give them renewed vision, oh God, I renew a passion in them for you, O oh God. Not for providing and, and just pursuing things in this world, O oh God. Not, not for a vision that the culture has given or put on us, O oh God. But Father, vision for who you want us to be. For what you have called us to, O oh God. God, I pray for every father in this uh, house and, uh, and connected with this ministry, O oh God, that you would bless them, you would keep them, you would strengthen them today. Father, may, them, may they feel their value and word from you, O oh God, and even their families today, O oh God. And may they be celebrated in an amazing way. And for those who have uh, lost fathers or those who want to be fathers and have not been, for those who are going to become fathers and uh, God, that was taken away from them. For those fathers who've lost children, O oh God, uh, God, I pray for your Holy Spirit to be comforted. God, for all who are uh, missing their fathers on today, a day like today, oh God, especially. And God, may you bring healing and strength and comfort. And God, may you bring fresh revelation that you are still their Heavenly Father and you are still with them. God, so comfort, love them, but help us as a community to love those who are hurting today, oh God. But help us to celebrate the fathers that we do have amongst us, oh God. Bless them, keep them, and Father, keep all of us, oh God, in our battles. As we stand, as we have that resolve to not be moved, oh God, in this season. We thank you today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hope City fam, I love you guys. For all the fathers, I really, oh my God, you don't know. I really wish. I could be with you, really wish, but I'm so grateful for all of you who've showed up and celebrated, and in my absence, you will, you will enjoy those gifts that we have for you guys, all right, <laughs> I love you all so much, but for our entire
church family keep keep fighting don't give up don't give up hold on to the word god is with you he's fighting for you and he's the one that strengthens you i love you guys i am going to see you soon i promise you with that until next time next week love you guys i'll see you keep fighting the good fight of faith all right god bless you